Hello, everybody. It's really, uh, really good to be with you all, here with you all, uh, those in person and those at home as well. Um, for those who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Matt, and I usually attend the afternoon service, the 4 p.m. service. So it's actually really good to see um, some familiar faces here as well. Um, people who used to be at PM, who moved to AM, and things like that. Uh, it's really awesome. Uh, but let's get into the passage today. Because, so the other day, I was actually chatting with someone, uh, and we went out for lunch, as usual. We had a meal, and, you know, we were just catching up afterwards. Very simple. And as we were talking, the, something happened, right? I was looking at him, we were talking, and I see this little green leaf stuck in his mouth, in his, in his teeth, I mean. And, you know, it's one of those things where once you notice it, it's actually really hard not to notice it. Like, it will always be there in your peripheral vision. Wherever you look, it will be sticking out towards you. And so, throughout the whole conversation, I was contemplating whether I should actually say something or not. You know, whether I should just point it out or leave it for someone else to do with it. You know, like, let, I guess, this person's spouse tell them a bit later on. But friends, I wonder what you, you would do in that situation. You know, I wonder if you would actually say something, or would you just try and um, not say anything at all? Because for me, I, I decided to just leave it alone. <laughs> I wanted to uh, avoid the, the potential embarrassment of having to say something. So I was trying really hard to concentrate on what they were saying and not, not look at it, look at their face and, and understand them. But the funny thing about this as well was that we're actually with other people, and no one else actually said anything either. either. Now, it wasn't just me, but it was everyone else at the table who didn't say anything. You know, it's quite interesting, friends, that in life we often have these opportunities, right? Opportunities where we have to make a choice, where, whether we would speak up and say something, or whether we would sit down and just be quiet. But sometimes these choices are actually more serious. They're more consequential than others that sometimes we actually need to speak up and actually say something. And I'll bring it a little bit closer to home, something that we might all uh, be able to relate with a bit more. Uh, here at church, even, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, is, you know, what if you were chatting in a group and you happen to hear like a leaf in, stuck in someone's um, teeth, but talking about real things with real consequences for you, for the people involved, and for the people around them as well. Things that would actually matter in six billion years. And so maybe the question more importantly for us should be, why should we get involved? Why should we get involved? Friends, before we get into the passage, let me pray. We're going to ask for God's help and to guide us through this passage. Let's pray together. Friend, uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing all of us here today. Thank you that we can come to church, whether that's in person or uh, whether that's over live stream. Uh, we just pray that you'd, you'd be with us now. Uh, give us your spirit to guide us to this passage. Uh, help us to understand what it is that you want us to learn today. Uh, but also, we pray that you'd help us to think about what uh, uh, today's passage uh, means for us and how we can actually apply it in our lives too. I uh, pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Well, friends, here we are again, uh, where Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about a problem. They accuse him of being a snake, pretty much. Because verse 16 to 17, this is what it says. It says, Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you. Yet crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any of the men that I sent to you? Friends, Paul is being sarcastic here. <laughs> I hope you noticed that because he's describing himself as a crafty fellow. The Holman translation puts it as a sly person who was deceitful. And so a bit of context to this, just so we can go get on the same page. Um, remember when Paul sent Titus and some of the brothers to get the collection in 2 Corinthians 8? So it was a few weeks ago we, we read about this and we went through it. Um, it was a special collection because of the famine in Jerusalem. And so Paul encouraged them to give to support their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. So that's the context to it. And what the Corinthians were doing, they were accusing Paul of taking some of that money and, put, and pocketing it himself as payment. You know, it's as if Paul didn't want to take their financial support uh, in front of them, but he took it from them behind their back. He was being sneaky. He was being a snake. That's what the Corinthians were accusing Paul of. So they're taking that problem and taking it one step further. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was going out with, with my friends for dinner. 
And for some reason, there was this table next to us, a bunch of people who were also having dinner, and that was very interesting. They were very loud. Uh, you just, like, they always got your attention sort of thing. But something very interesting happened uh, at the end of the meal. You know, they, they had the meal, they chatted and whatnot, and the time came where they needed going to leave, so they had to pay the bill. And so immediately, one guy stood up and he told them all, don't worry, friends, I'm going to take care of the bill. Don't worry about it. But then as soon as he said that, everyone else offered as well. They said, no, 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 don't worry, I'll take care of the bill. And someone else, no, 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 don't worry, I'll do it, I'll do it. You know, it's all like a chorus. They all say it one after the other. But this is the interesting, the interesting thing that happened, because whilst everyone said that they would actually, that they would pay the bill, uh, no one actually got up to do it, except for that first guy. Because as he walked towards the counter, everyone else was just seated. They sat down. They didn't even follow him at all. You see, they had only offered to pay, but really it was a half-hearted sort of offer. Something that they just said, um, but they were being a little bit sneaky, you could say. Friends, this is what Paul is accused of doing. You know, it's as if, as, as if this group of people were half-heartedly offering to pay, but they didn't really mean it. It's as if Paul actually wanted their money, but then he took it from them behind their back. You know, the Corinthians have taken that original problem and taken it one step further. Now, let's pause here for a minute, because we've really got a feel for Paul right now, don't we? Like, here is Paul, who's doing good for the Corinthians. Like, he loves them, he genuinely loves them and doesn't want to be a burden to them. But the Corinthians respond the most worst way possible. Because not only do they not listen to Paul, they actually get angry at Paul for doing it. And they accuse him of doing something even worse. It's as if they were making him the perpetrator and they were the victims. Because for me, like at this point, I would seriously just give up and walk away. You know, I've done everything that I can. They don't listen to me and they actually attack me for it. But friends, I wonder if you've found yourself in a similar situation, in a position where uh, you've tried to help someone genuinely, but then it just gets interpreted in the wrong way possible. It gets interpreted as if you are the one in the wrong. It's a frustrating feeling, I'm sure. And I reckon Paul does feel this same, same way as well, to a certain extent. Paul would be frustrated, but... You know, Paul being Paul, he's a lot more humble, he's a lot more patient than I am. He's probably a lot more patient and humble than a lot of you are as well. And he responds in a different way. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but he tells us why he responds like this. And this is the point, the reason that he said. Because despite all of this, he tells us the reason for his response, or the reason why he is speaking up, why he's explaining things to the Corinthians. And we find this reason in verse 19. This is what it says. I'll read it out to you all. It says, Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. Friend, Paul hasn't been defending himself this whole time because everything that he has done has been for their strengthening. The Holman translation says it was, everything was done for building them up. It was done for their good. I recently got Disney Plus. Again, some of you might have Disney Plus. It's really awesome. I got it during on the sale, quick frenzy sale. Uh, it was $2 for the first month. And so I'm at the moment where I'm trying to catch up on everything. All the Marvel movies, all the, I guess, TV shows, High School Musical, if you guys know what High School Musical is, the TV show as well. And once I catch up, I'm going to cancel it so I don't have to watch it again, don't have to pay the money. But when I was watching this, one of my favorite, I guess, Avengers is actually Iron Man. I find him pretty, pretty awesome. And his story, his, his arc story is really cool because he starts off as that spoiled rich kid. You know, he could get anything that he want and he's really smart as well. And he knows that he's smarter than everyone else. But then as the movie progresses, he changes his ways and he becomes one of the greatest heroes of Earth. He actually becomes a role model to a lot of people. But then there's this time in between where, where people actually started to back away from him. You know, where Iron Man, one of the Avengers, one of Earth's mightiest heroes at one point was being despised against by the people. The very same people that he saved. In fact, 
even some members of his own team of the Avengers started to turn against him as well. But even despite all of this, Iron Man continued to fight. If you know the story, he can teach change. He loved people more than he loved himself. Spoiler alert, he gave up his life for Earth as well because he cared more about Earth and its people than himself. Friends, this is what Paul is facing. This is, this is Paul's reason. You know, he could have just easily walked away from the Corinthians because he knew he was in their right. He could have just left them in their sins. He could have given them over to the super apostles who would have just corrupted their whole way of living and thinking. But he cared for them more. And he wanted them to get things right so they could live lives worthy of the gospel. That was Paul's reason. Not to defend, but to strengthen and to build them up. And so, looking at this passage and reflecting on what the application is for us, there are a few things, I think, that we can actually learn from this. And the first one, and this is probably the most important one, the one that is not uh, as clear, is that uh, while Paul is talking about responding to certain situations, uh, I guess in the context of giving, he's also actually also referring to everything else that he has said to the Corinthians. You know, things that Paul wasn't necessarily being accused of, but things that Paul heard or saw that weren't in line with the Bible, with the Corinthian church. And so the question for us is, uh, or the question that we think about is, would we speak up when we see something not quite right in our brother or sister? Because it's not just about how we respond after we have rebuked as someone, but it's also about whether we would actually take that first step, whether we would actually speak up when we see something to put ourselves in that potential situation where we might be attacked because we have spoken up. Because as we mentioned earlier and we talked about it, that Asian culture that is inbuilt in a lot of us tells us that we shouldn't. It tells us that we should just let it be because it's not our business or because we don't want to disrespect the other person. If we say something to them, it means we're disrespecting them, disrespecting ourselves, and that's just something we don't want to do. But the problem with doing this is that sometimes our inaction actually approves of what someone is doing. You know, by not saying anything, by not speaking up, and acting as if the problem isn't there, we sweep it all under the rug. We affirm and say, yep, what you're doing is okay, because we don't actually tell them to us. And it's on the screen, I'll read it out. It says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of the two or three witnesses. If they refuse to listen still, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would uh, a pagan or a tax collector. Friends, Jesus' message is quite clear, right? We need to take sin seriously. But do you also see what else we need to take seriously? Is that we need to be speaking up to one another when we see a brother or sister sin. Friends, the process starts with you, for you to go and have that conversation between the two of you, to bring it up to them. And the final step, uh, if all else fails, is then to go to the church, is then for the minister and the elders and kings and leaders and Bible study leaders uh, to get involved. So friends, don't shy away from speaking out against your brother or sister. Do it in a loving way, not to defend yourself or to make yourself feel better, but in a way that is for the other person's benefit. So that's the first thing I think we can learn from this passage. But there is also another thing that we can learn, and that's, uh, and this is probably the more obvious one, is where we ask ourselves the question, I guess, how would we respond in Paul's situation? I guess, would you walk away when your good intentions have been misconstrued? or when you're being accused and attacked. Because for many of us, our natural reaction would be to defend ourselves, right? Like, when we have the best of intentions to do something, but then we get attacked and accused for it, we would naturally put up our walls and would fight back, especially because we know that we aren't the ones in the wrong, because we know that we're right, and we're trying to do them a favor. favor. You know, Paul Tripp is a, is a sermon a pastor and author, he once said this, and I think it's really on point. He said that we are all the best internal defensive attorneys. 
You know, we will fight to the death if required, and we will do anything when we are backed into the corner. We will fight hard for ourselves. And I reckon that is true for many of us, or if not all of us. You know, once we feel that we're being attacked, our internal lawyer will kick in and we'll fight back. But friends, as we've seen today, our first reaction shouldn't be to defend, but it's to strengthen, it's to build up the other person. Our response in these situations is to love the other person because we want to see them flourish. Why? Well, because verse 19 tells us that we are in Christ. We are a family. And so when you go up to someone and tell them that what they are doing is wrong or it's not in line with the Bible, that they are hurting themselves and they hunt you down and belittle you for it, don't respond to defend yourself as your first reaction. You know, don't put up that defense mechanism. Don't call your internal lawyer, but respond to love them. Respond to want what's best for them, not for yourself. And I understand and I agree it's going to be hard. It's going to be very difficult to do so. But we want to respond in love because we care for them. Because for Paul, he, he loves the Corinthians a lot. He loves them so much that he's actually afraid for them. He considers them such dear friends that he's afraid that they will still be the same, that they will be stuck in their sin. Because have a look at verse 20, 21. This is what he says. Uh, he says, For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I'll be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. Friends, Paul's not afraid because of how bad it will look for him. Paul is afraid because he loves them. He sees them as dear friends, and he's afraid for them. He's afraid that they'll be stuck in their sin, that they won't change. So friends, don't defend yourself, even though that's our first reaction. Love them when they respond in a way that is not, uh, I guess, helpful for us. Let me finish with this. Um, the idea of strengthening and building each other up, uh, let me encourage you that it's actually not just in response to rebuking someone, because it's actually positive as well. Strengthening and building each other up includes thanking someone for the things that they do at church, you know, it's acknowledging and praising when your brother or sister decides to live in line with the gospel rather than continuing the sin that they've been uh, stuck in. It's even as simple as saying hello to the welcomers as you come into church or saying thank you to people serving on stage, you know, on music, prayer, Bible reading, or even the sound and live stream team. It, it includes meeting up with one another to go through the Bible together, to learn with each other. It's about having fellowship with each other after church, getting to know each other and building that relationship Um, so that you could potentially have the hard conversations if required. Friends, strengthening and building each other up means to encourage each other as well. It's not just all about the negatives as we have gone through, but it's also about the positives. So let me firstly thank all of you for coming to church and being a part of God's church here. But let me also encourage you to take on that responsibility, to play play your part in this church working bee, as we call it, to strengthen to build one another up in Christ as dear friends, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as part of God's family. Let me pray. We'll finish up there. Let's pray together. Uh, Dear Father, we want to thank you for your good and gracious and loving God. Uh, We want to pray that you'd be with us. Uh, We pray that you'd help us um, to speak up when we see things that aren't quite right, when we see a brother or sister Um, who is in sin, who is living their life in a way that is not uh, what you wanted for them. Uh, We pray that you'd help us, give us the courage, but also give us the wisdom um, to know what to say, how to say it, and even when to say it. But ultimately, uh, we pray that you'd help us to do it um, with the motivation to love them, the motivation to care for them, to strengthen them and build them up and not to defend ourselves or to make ourselves feel better. Uh, God, we know this is going to be very difficult for a lot of us, and it's going to be hard to do. And I guess when they respond in a way that is not, uh, um, not, not expected, uh, that's going to be even more difficult for us to, I guess, uh, uh, respond. 
But we just pray that you'd be with us and give us, uh, I guess, comfort and, and, and trust, help us to trust in you, uh, knowing that you are the great God who loves us, who is working uh, for all our good. I pray all of this in your son's most precious name. Amen.